<laughs> okay, thank you, Jacob. We are now recording. Um, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's Word for Word event. This is our final event of the 22-23 season, and we are thrilled, as always, to end it with a graduate student spotlight. Uh, our six graduate readers tonight were selected by capstone and thesis instructors for their exceptional storytelling skills and high literary achievement. And we're very excited to hear them read from recent work tonight. Please note that these readings do include sensitive subject matter that may not be suitable for all audiences. If at any time you feel overwhelmed, feel free to step away and return when you are willing or able to. Finally, as this is a creative writing celebration, Please keep chat comments and comments in the Q&A specific to craft and storytelling. And of course, you know, you can also just say, great job. Uh, Q&A will follow the readings. Uh, and it, so if you post your questions in the Q&A, that's the time at which we'll surface them um, to our readers. Um, every uh, reader tonight is welcome to preface their story with an overview or additional content warning uh, whatever they like to say or not say, uh, you can just dive right in as well if that's what you like. Um, sometimes it's helpful for, for readers to hear a little bit of context, especially if what you're reading is an excerpt from something that's occurring later on in your story or novel. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our first reader tonight from the MFA, Kaylin Reed Shipunga. Um, it's my <laughs> pleasure to uh, to welcome her back. Uh, she has been she hasn't been in a word for word before, but we featured uh, Kaylin as our um, spotlight in the MFA newsletter a while back. Um, Kaylin is a writer, literacy coach and preservationist of the African diaspora's reconnection with Africa. She documents this rekindling through blogging videography and her upcoming cross-continental black romances and Afro-utopian fantasies. She enjoys exploring the concept of black liberation through life and love abroad and black utopian societies. This passion has taken Kaylin from her native New York City to Namibia, where she lives with her husband, son, and daughter and manages a literacy clinic. A Howard University journalism graduate, Kaylin has worked in media in both the US and Namibia. She is best known for her YouTube channel, Afro-American in Africa, where she chronicles her life abroad in Namibia. Kaylin is also the founding editor of the African America in, African, uh, in Africa website, which chronicles the experiences of Black Americans living across Africa. Her debut Black fantasy romance novel, Ancestrally, will be released in 2025, and I believe she's going to be reading an excerpt of that for us tonight. So welcome, Kaylin. Okay, thank you very much. And this is an excerpt from chapter 15 of the novel, my thesis novel um, titled Of Liberation. Um, the novel is titled Ancestrally. Uh, and in this chapter, um, the protagonist, Zora, is a Black American. She has recently arrived or been led to the West African country of Benin by her ancestors. And so she's on a bus. Uh, going to a rural area of Benin. Chapter 15 of Liberation. Legalité salalial pour tu, the crowd chanted. An hour and a half later, we were arriving in yet another tiny town. As our van slowly pulled in, I could hear loud, impassioned chanting growing louder. Through the window, I saw a massive crowd of people marching and shouting in the street. All the passengers on our bus slid their windows fully open for a better look. What are they saying? I asked. Equal pay for all, Adez said. From who? The government. People are losing patience. Unemployment is high and many jobs are going to the Chinese instead of the locals. And those who are fortunate enough to be employed make very little. The wealthy are eating a lot of the money through corruption while the majority of this country remains poor. These people are asking for a fair playing field with the elites and foreigners. His eyes were ablaze with passion. These are good, hardworking people that just want to be able to comfortably put food on their tables and have basic utilities, consistent water, electricity, and sanitation, he continued. 
They want their children to get a good education and for money to be put into, into building more classrooms and schools instead of it being pillaged through corrupt deals. A wave of self-consciousness swept over me and told me to stay quiet. Saddled with my American comforts, it didn't feel appropriate for me to respond or even participate in this conversation. Even in my darkest moments, I still had many more, much more than many of these people had. I had a wealthy, successful boyfriend, and I'd even quit a job. And yet, I had been finding every little reason to complain. I suddenly felt like the spoiled American brat Adaze had painted me out to be. The rich have forgotten their ancestors, Adaze said. They've forgotten who they are and where they come from, forgotten to care about their own people. Our forefathers would never take for themselves without considering the entire community first. And that is why we hold our ancestors with such respect. They sacrificed so much for us and continue to watch over us from the afterlife. But they must be disappointed in the state of our country now. I studied the faces of the crowd closer. Many of the women were marching with babies on their backs. Some were younger, but even older women carried infants as well. Others walked with their hands locked in the palms of little children at their side. Under the burn of the afternoon Benin sun, this cause had to be a heavy load to bear. And yet even the children's short legs moved with an energetic fervor and never missed a step. There were men carrying signs made out of cloth and cardboard. Their deep bellows were the loudest as they chanted in unison. Smaller groups of protesters danced in formation and sang. Fierce determination was painted across the faces of the crowd. The zeal of the crowd grew more intense by the minute. The energy of the air was electric and thick. Armed guards with rifles stood along the roadside with watchful eyes. Their faces stoic and their hands in positions on their rifles. They appeared unmoved by the emotion flowing through the march. A daze stuck his head outside of his window and screamed, Legalité! Salalial! Portu! Everyone in the bus turned around in amazement, as if to see who dared to breach our spectating position. He chanted again and then shook his fist firmly in support. He kept chanting and before I knew it, the entire bus had joined him, offering their camaraderie. Our bus driver began honking incessantly in support as well. In return, smiling and waving protesters cheered us on and jovially banged the side of the bus in solidarity. The entire scene was surreal. I'd gone from a life of playing it safe in corporate America to finding myself in the heart of a political protest in West Africa. It was a far cry from my New York City lifestyle of comfort and predictability. Under Jason's tutelage, I'd spent most of my, work, my time at work focused on playing things safe and respectable so as not to ruin our chances for success. That was Jason's motto. Play the white man's game. Let him feel comfortable with you. Do whatever he wants to allow yourself to get to the top. And like a silly little girl, I'd believed him up until the day I'd quit at the station. But a day's was the opposite. Here he was, unapologetic and not giving a damn about pleasing any bureaucrats. As he cheered in support of the crowd, his spirit filled, spilled over with passion. It was a passion for his people, for the everyday Beninese, for the roadside street vendors selling fruit to their children, and for the success of the youth, the future leaders of Benin. A daze had taken me by surprise. Until now, I saw him as a condescending braggart who enjoyed making others feel small. Yet this, was the, this wasn't the man in front of me. At this moment, there wasn't a callous bone in his body. He was a man of the people, a son of the soil, who deeply cared for the masses and for fairness and equality. He was a man of values and humility. A daze was the opposite of the self-serving, individualistic attitude that had poisoned American culture. His unexpected metamorphosis was quite a beautiful evolution to witness. And then, crack, crack, crack. Chaos erupted in the streets and the crowd scrambled for cover. The armed guards I'd noticed moments before were now firing gunshots. Cow, cow, crack, crack. I pulled Adaze's head back into the bus. Get in here before you get your head blown off, I said. With stormy eyes, Adaze looked at me and then turned back to the window. Tlaters, he yelled out the window. He continued to scream at the officers in French. They think a uniform and, and the government putting a gun on their belt makes them better than these people. You're just the same as the rest of us, he yelled more, but in French. I yanked him away from the window and slammed it shut. A daze. If you don't care about yourself, at least think of everyone else. There's even a baby sitting next to us. What happens if they start shooting at the bus? He stopped yelling. 
the mention of the baby seemed to splinter through his rage. He leaned back in his seat, looking defeated. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such a gripping scene. Um, it's hard to imagine where, where it goes from there, but I guess we'll find out soon when your book is published. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's, I, I, I'm surprised, I have to say, to, to hear you characterize this as like, as a romance, because when I'm reading this, I'm thinking like, well, there's attraction between these characters, but it's so, the scene is, it's like immured in, in social protest, and it's also vivid, and there's violence on the streets, and there's talk about, you know, about the oppressive government, and, and it, it just seems like, tell me how, how you get the romance into that kind of, setting yeah the romance actually it starts appearing with like within a, a page or two but because of the time constraints i decided not to read it um but it's essentially you know zora the protagonist she is um you know kind of a, characterized by this this uh guy as a spoiled american and they're traveling through his country together and on this trip um you know he starts she starts to break his stereotypes about americans and uh, she in turn starts to fall in love with him and realize that, you know, he's not this monster that just thinks she's a spoiled brat. And so just on their trip throughout uh, West Africa, they just basically begin to fall in love. Um, and it goes on from there. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, and you, you can see the beginnings of that here, definitely. Yeah. So um, I'm going to move on to our, our next reader and we'll have you back on uh, very shortly to talk some more about your writing and your book. Thanks so okay. much, Kaylin. Thank you. Um, and our next reader is going to be Aaron Seaman. So Aaron, if you can come on screen, that would be great. And Caitlin, if you can, I, can sign off, that would be cool. Don't sign off, stay, but just turn your camera on. Okay, so um, Aaron uh, resides in the Pacific Northwest and lives to write dangerous stories that provoke deep thoughts about morality and the duality of human nature. Along with an MFA in creative writing, he also has two undergrad degrees fo focusing on different portions of history. Prior to writing, Aaron spent seven years in the United States Navy and a decade as a wildland firefighter, EMT, and radio communications specialist for the U.S. Forest Service. He is an avid climber, distance runner, and in fact, the last time we spoke, he was just about to go out for a run and world traveler That's right. and has been to the South Pole, the North Pole and all the other lonely places in between. Beautifully put. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Um, for the record, I haven't actually been to the North Pole. Um, I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Um, I want to also um, issue a more direct trigger warning about what I'm about to read. It's from my uh, master's thesis, The Lonely Places, which is about the veteran suicide epidemic where 22 of us uh, kill ourselves per day. Uh, that's an older stat, but that's roughly once an hour. And I don't think that that's OK. Um, so without further ado, here we go. Um, I actually need to start my timer here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. It's the idea of the steel, the thought of the blade. It's never the thought of actually dying. It's always the feel of the Tonto bladed Emerson CQC 7B knife in your hand, perfectly weighted. The rough composite handle, the blade lock, the gravity assist open, the matte coating on the blade subdued so it won't reflect light. The angles made for prying and piercing, flesh, body armor, small spaces, lots of damage. And it's that one perfect point, the point between the forward bevel that strikes off at a clean 45 degree angle and the main blade, long, impossibly straight and deadly sharp. It's that one point where they come together that becomes the obsession, open wrist and life. It becomes the only thing that you think about after a few glasses of bourbon alone. You want to die, so you start thinking of the blade, obsessing over the blade, dreaming of the blade, the feel of the razor sharp point slicing your skin. You try it a few times on your arm or your thigh because you want to know what it would feel like. 
And because you know it's not going to kill you, hell, it might even leave a cool scar. Call it a test run. And if you do it on your thigh, you can hide it. No one's going to know that you're in love with death, that you want to lick its earlobe, touch its titty under the shirt, that you want to fuck death like you wanted to fuck that first girl in high school. It just is. You're in love. Once you do that, once you cut your arm or your thigh, you know the real won't be that bad. This is what people don't understand about cutting your wrists. It barely hurts. The blade is so fucking sharp that you barely feel it make its way through the skin, let alone the adipose tissue and veins below. And if you do it the right way, the correct way, you might even be lucky enough to get it right. Your ghoulish love affair with death will become a marriage. No more cheating. No more chance meetings in hotel rooms for work or on vacations. No more hiding. You are both together now, forever. But only if you're lucky. And on the bad nights, the nights when the memories get so overwhelming, so chaotic, so fractured, that's when you think about it the most. The nights when you don't know the difference between the memories and reality anymore. They told you that was called a flashback. Those nights, nothing can take the thought away. Not the bourbon, not the weed, not the psych meds the VA prescribed you, not all of them together, nothing you've tried. The last time, they just pumped your stomach. In the apartment, phone in hand, numbers programmed, messenger apps open, friends online, unanswered messages from a family a month old, voicemail full. You're completely alone, finally. Outside, the day is fading into that wan evening milk light of midwinter. Anthemic purples and reds bathe the pine trees. Shadows play out the snow. It's fucking magical. It reminds you of the mountains, of your home. That time you summited Mount Rainier during the storm and when it cleared, you felt so alive as you watched the sunrise from 14,000 feet. Or the time you felt the chill of the alpine night, straining to catch a glimpse of the full moon as it rose over Mount St. Helens. You could even see Mount Hood to the south and the stars. Oh, God, the fucking stars. You think to yourself that this could be what heaven is like. Not bullshit, bearded guy in the sky heaven, but real heaven. What death could actually be like. And it's inviting because, quite frankly, the weight of living with your memories would be over. Not because you want to leave your most prized relationships, not because you actually want to leave without your best friend who happens to be your cat, because you have come to believe that humans are parasites. Mm, no, you can't leave your cat. Fuck humans, but not her. Never her. That's how fucked up this shit gets. The totems that you cling to in the maelstrom of the void, those things that actually keep you alive. Sometimes it's a significant other or a parent. Sometimes it's those you've served with. Sometimes it's something that seems utterly inexplicable to anyone who has never been there before, like your cat. Fuck that, though. Better to live for a cat than to die from memories. And the blade, it calls to you because you can't stop from feeling like you're carrying the burden of the dead. And although those dead may not mean shit to other people, to civilians, they mean something to you. And alone in your apartment with your Emerson CQC-7B with its Tonto blade, perfect point between the bevels, you want to let the darkness consume you. The darkness is something you and your veteran buddies all know. It's not that civilians haven't had shit happen to them, but the darkness is something that every veteran knows. And you, you wish they were here with you now, your vet buddies, because honestly, let's be clear, you're fresh out of reasons to keep fighting to keep living. It's not that you're a coward. You've been facing this your entire life. Everybody does. Maybe it was since you were molested as a kid or since your parents beat you or some idealized version of a girlfriend or boyfriend left you. Or maybe it's since that time you had your, your friend overdosed. You know, it could have been the funerals though. You think that a lot, but you don't ever like to admit it. Was it the funerals? All the next of kin sobbing into their handkerchiefs as you handed them the flag and looked them in the eyes. Yeah, you think it could have been them. And ever since then, since that exact moment, the moment of your birth into the spontaneous neural lacuna of PTSD, you have been alone in deep space in the vast light years between stars, the deep black fighting this enemy. 
unreachable, derelict, an ex-sailor captaining a soulless human meat sack ghost ship, skin over bone frame, but nothing inside, nothing inside. And the blade seems like a good idea to you after those bourbons, because you know that the memories will never stop and that you'll always be nothing inside. Because those memories, they're an insatiable foe bent on your destruction, and there's no way you can fight them on your own, not without your vet buddies, not alone. Jesus fucking Christ, you wish they were here now. Just one more time, like when you went through the PTSD program, just one more time so you could feel like somebody had your back because it's been a long time since someone's had your back and you're fucking tired and you're fresh out of reasons to let that blade slice your wrist. Maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you've been to the institutions. Yes, God, I'm a good little boy. Little Timmy's tried the path of nonviolence. He's tried to forgive himself and others. I've tried your opiate, smoked it, snorted it, injected it, jerked off to it. I've done it all, God. But life is violent, and your memories are violent, and your mind is turbulent and troubled, and you want to be free of violence, but you are violence. Duality, everything and nothing at the same time except mostly nothing. So you ask a God that you don't believe in what you should do because you're fresh out of reasons. And that knife, it's sharp and it's real. And God's not, but you beg anyway. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that uh, reading. It's so intense and so honest and and uh, obviously coming, coming right from the heart, uh, tempered with uh, all the wordsmithing uh, of a gifted writer, just just really amazing work. Um, Thank you. Thank and how 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 difficult? I mean, obviously, this is a very personal thing for you, as you mentioned at the beginning of of uh, the pref prefatory remarks that you offered. How how are you able to to um, take that kind of intense personal emotion and connection and fashion it into prose that's so uh, that's that's so I don't want to say clinical, but it's it's so, so precise and and really, you know, does the job that you're trying to get it to do. Um, it's my therapy. I mean, this is the one place where uh, these thoughts that are fictional, I mean, they're real, they're in my head. These are things that happen and these are things that have happened to real people that I know. But they're fictional here. And and that helps me not make them real. Let me put it that way. Right. Yeah. But it's also uh, to making a connection to to civilians like me, but also to your fellow well, veterans. Yeah, fair. And I mean, I guess that's my whole point is like, I mean, I'm not like uber like patriotic or, you know, go veteran or whatever. Like, I just want people to understand kind of what folks are going through because I didn't until I did this program that I talked about. And so I... I'm I'm hoping that civilians, I hate this term so much, man. I'm hoping that civilians read this and they go, oh shit, things are bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's all I want. That's the only connection I want. So if you got that connection and anybody else did, then I'm good with that. Definitely. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to move, move on. Um, thank you so You're much. Good. We'll have you back on in just a bit. Uh, I'm going right. to pass the baton over to uh, Jacob at this point. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, Sharon, if, if you'd like to hop on camera, you're, you're more than happy to. Uh, totally fine as well. Um, our next guest tonight, uh, who, who is Sharon, uh, couldn't unfortunately read. Um, can everyone hear me? Paul, you seem to have frozen. I can hear you. OK, great. <laughs> yeah, the camera froze and I got a little paranoid that again, my my headphones, I think my headphones are on their last life. So I just wanted to make sure. OK, so anyways, uh, Sharon could not, unfortunately, uh, she couldn't read for us tonight, um, but I'm honored to read the work on her behalf. Um, and I'm going to give a little bit of a bio before uh, I get into it here. So uh, Sharon Zealous was born in Jamaica, West Indies and emigrated to United States in July 1979 and currently lives in Southern California with her husband, William. She earned an AAS degree with honors from New York City College of Technology, formerly Brooklyn Technical College, in 1982, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacy from Long Island University, uh, formerly known as Arnold and Marie College of Pharmacy, in 1985. 
After graduating from LIU, she worked in the civilian sector for three years before joining the U.S. Navy in 1988. In 2000, she earned a Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. And after serving in the Navy for 20 years, she retired in 2008, but continued working as a civilian pharmacist, retiring for the second time at the end of 2021. Along the way, she earned an MBA from Webster University, which she hopes to parlay into a business venture. She decided to pursue the MA degree in creative writing at Southern New Hampshire University because she hopes that writing will keep her brain functioning at the highest level well into her twilight years. She's excited by the wealth of information that she has acquired through this two-year journey and can't wait to see what the future holds. So welcome again, Sharon, and I shall be reading uh, this piece. Um, did we decide, did we want to call it the pothole or, or why me? Okay, I couldn't hear you, but I think I saw the pothole. Okay, <laughs> all right, so I'll go ahead and start. Later that day, my sister-in-law, Lily, called. I ran to pick up the phone before it went to voicemail. I had been eagerly waiting to hear from Lily for a few days in the aftermath of her back surgery. I wondered why anyone would go through such a risky procedure at 80 years old, but I kept that thought to myself. The doctor had reassured her that the surgery to fuse a few discs in her lower back would take approximately eight hours, but instead it lasted twice as long, 16 and a half hours. Her hospital stay, which should have been approximately four days, stretched into two weeks. They could not get her pain under control. But now, finally, she was at home trying to perform her activities of daily living with the help of her 75-year-old husband, my brother. She was on high-dose narcotics, both long and short-acting, around the clock, which made it difficult for her to stay awake. Sometimes she slurred her words, and I had trouble understanding her. But today, her speech was as clear as daylight. How are you feeling? I asked. I am great. Your brother's in the hospital, she continued in one breath. He went to the doctor again today for the same pain he's been having in his throat. They kept giving him antibiotics and pain pills and even suggested home remedies like salt water gargle, but nothing has helped. Well, today they tried forcing a tube down to see what was going on. The tube went down, but it couldn't come back out. They cut a hole in his throat so that he could breathe and rushed him to the hospital in an ambulance. I just got home. Lily, oh my God, he was the one taking care of you. What are you going to do now? I asked. I don't know. I'm going to lay down now. I'm feeling tired, she responded. We said our goodbyes and hung up the phone. I have to go see Lily, I said to my husband, Stuart, later that night, as I lay in bed, tossing and turning, trying to figure out how to help her and my brother. The thought of driving to Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, where my brother and sister-in-law lived, filled me with dread. The 90-mile drive from my hometown to Kingston was fraught with danger was not an excursion for the faint of heart. There was no room for error on the narrow two-lane roads that accommodated traffic going in opposite directions, pedestrians walking on the side of the road, and a few stray cows and goats here and there. People drove at swooshing speed as if on the Indy 500 speedway, tooting their horns as they neared blind curves to alert oncoming drivers. The fear of a head-on head -on collision was always at the top of my mind, especially because of the potholes. Some roads seem to have more potholes than smooth surfaces. There is one close to Kingston that was fabled to swallow entire vehicles. It was dubbed by the locals as the Bermuda Triangle of Potholes. But by the morning my mind was made up. I felt a little better knowing that the only oncologist on the island, if needed, practiced at that hospital where my brother was admitted. I asked my husband to pack the car, an old beat-up red Jeep with no air conditioner. Who needs air conditioner when the passengers and drivers alike poke their heads out the window to shout greetings to friends and acquaintances as they speed by in their cars? I'm often amazed that people's limbs are not dismembered. I hastily dispelled these morbid images from my mind as I hugged and kissed my husband goodbye. Are you sure you don't want to come, me to come with you, he asked. As sure as can be. Wish me luck, I said to him. Luck, he said, grinning. Come back in one piece. Not funny. How about two pieces? I laughed as I waved goodbye. As I drove through the different parishes, I forced myself to concentrate on the beauty and tranquility of the countryside to dispel my fears. I, I drove through the scenic route of Portland with its beautiful miles of coastline and awe-inspiring blue mountain chain that was lulled into a peaceful state as I caught glimpses of its majestic peak. 
towering up to the sky. It was covered in lush greenery, accentu accentuated by fluffy white clouds hovering just above it. I imagined myself standing at the top, reaching to touch the clouds. I was still daydreaming when I was suddenly jolted back to reality. The car going in the opposite direction had swerved into my lane and was coming straight at me. As I swerved to avoid it, the dreaded Bermuda Triangle of potholes came into view, and I now realized why the driver had changed lanes. But I knew that if I fell on it, there was no coming out, so I yanked the steering wheel to get back into my lane. The yank set the car out of control. Dear God, I yelled, please forgive me. Of all of my sins, please, please forgive me, I prayed, as the car careened over the embankment, finally coming to a stop by the trunk of a coconut tree. Thank God for lack of air conditioner, I thought, as I crawled through the window, trying to ignore the excruciating pain that seemed to engulf my entire pot body. I tried to claw my way up the embankment, but with every small move, agonizing pain shot through my body like small jolts of electricity. Then everything turned black, and I was in a coma for two weeks. When I woke up, I learned that I broke both legs, punctured one lung, knocked out a few teeth, and banged up my head. The car was completely totaled. The good news was that Lily's niece was now staying with her and that my brother had surgery and was recovering well. I tried to recall the accident, though. All I could remember was the big gaping pothole. Imagine the air rushing from my front tires as the car hit the jagged edge and I narrowly missed falling into it. It sent shivers down my spine, and I closed my eyes at the thought of how close I came to being killed by it. I was tempted briefly to feel sorry for myself, but now at 65, I fully understood the words of my mother when I was a teenager, and I seemed mad at the world. Ask yourself, why me? Only when you count your blessings, only when you count your blessings, not when you were upset, she would often say. And she would write why, like the letter why. I thought it was because of her lack of high school education, but when I tried to correct her, she explained that the image of the letter Y gave me two choices. I could either go up the left with complaints that made me further miserable, or I could go up the right, where if I looked at the positives in my life, I could free my mind to see the lessons that my current circumstance is trying to teach me. With that, I visited the site of the accident, and I got to work. I called the office of several politicians. I spoke to the pastors of all the churches on the island, regardless of uh, religious affiliation, and I organized young people to knock on doors. I called on popular musicians and on business owners for sponsorship, and I pitched my idea, the Jamaican Pothole Festival. At first, people laughed. But after that, I explained that the festival would raise funds that would be used by the local people to fix these potholes in their villages and not go into the coffers of the politicians. They got on board with the idea. By unanimous decision, the people decided to hold the festival on May 24th, the day after Jamaican Labor Day. This tapped into the Labor Day theme of, quote, lending a helping hand for the betterment of all. The festival was held on the street that contained the pothole. And the opening ceremony paid solemn respect to those that lost loved ones or those that suffered injuries because of an encounter with this pothole. But as the smoke from the makeshift barbecue grills and the smell of jerk chicken and jerk pork filled the air, people began to relax and sway their hips to calypso and reggae music struck up by the bands. As the first float came into view, the crowd parted the streets with a thunderous cheer. The floats were adorned in a variety of beautiful flowers, poinciana, red, hibiscus, and orchids. People waved placards with pictures of streets riddled with potholes. But the most impressive float was the one with vehicles damaged beyond repair, piled high. And sitting on top of the pile was our old red Jeep. Leaning against my husband, I stiffened as it came into view. He put both arms around me, pulling me closer to the body to his body as the float passed by. I closed my eyes briefly and whispered, why me? Immediately, I imagined a Jamaica with beautifully paved streets, cars in pristine conditions, and pedestrians with big wide grins on their faces as they walked on overhead passes instead of on the busy streets. I have work to do, I thought. That is where it ends. 
and I just very much enjoyed reading that. Thank you for allowing me to do that, Sharon. I'm so sorry that your voice um, wasn't cooperating with you, uh, but it's so good to have you here. Uh, do you see a, a mute a mic feature at the top to see if you can unmute so that there you go. Uh, awesome. I, think I did. Yeah. You did. Awesome. Um, just wonderful. I I really enjoyed reading this piece. I know um, when when you sent it in, um, it was it was a, a lot longer. And it is it a, a part of a memoir or is it uh, is it fictional or can you can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for writing it? Well, this is actually part of my um, stories that I'm writing for my thesis. So this is story number four or five, I think, in the whole series. And when I started writing it, I actually named it Why, why I mean, entitled it Why Me? And, but after the, and not Why Me, because I wanted to have a pity party, but more Why Me? Because of all the wonderful things in my life and there was so much suffering in the world. But after the first um, paragraph, I couldn't figure out how else to incorporate other stories into it. And so I thought of my brother-in-law, actually it is my brother's brother who's actually going through what's happening in the story actually right now and her and his wife. And, but after I wrote that second scene, I then had to bring the story back to Jamaica and I incorporated the pothole and the pothole festival and all that part is fictional. It's it's fascinating because of the the way that it just unfolds and and f flows out. It, it feels so like almost autobiographical in nature. Like like and and you were you just did a beautiful job of threading all of these narratives together and just creating a story where you know ultimately the the protagonist is just saying, "I I have to go see my brother in the hospital, and you know this is going to be a dangerous drive there, but I got to do it." and you know that that foreshadowing about this pothole and and the outcome that that comes from it and everything is just beautiful um and yes well thank you so much uh for allowing me to read it and stick around and we will uh, have a couple of questions at the end as well that we can ask you um but for now i'm going to uh, move on to our next reader um who's amanda garland and it is my pleasure to introduce her Hello, Amanda. Uh, she holds a she holds a BA in psychology from Christopher Newport University, an MA in higher and post secondary education from Columbia University, a graduate certificate in adult learning from the Johns Hopkins University, and an MA in English and Creative Writing from Southern New Hampshire University. Lots of degrees there. <laughs> At SNU, all very honorable too, if I might add. So. Uh, at SNU, she began work on Blackout Curtains, a novel of speculative fiction reimagining the 1960s Jane Collective in a 21st century context. Uh, grounded in the history of reproductive rights in America, the story explores the ways that Southern and religious values are often at odds with a woman's right to choose. Amanda teaches English and literature to community college students in Central Virginia, where she lives with her husband, two children, and an exceptionally fluffy rabbit named Bun Bun. Thank you so much for being with us, Amanda. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I have just a quick content warning that the story, as I uh, mentioned, does deal with um, abortion and pregnancy loss. So uh, there's also some strong language towards the end. So for that, I have to say, sorry, mom. <laughs> um, OK, we made the best of it. Oh, and the the um, scene is taking place in a car. There are several people in a vehicle together. We made the best of it. And I, I lean my head against the headrest. I continued delivering babies for women who were able to have the one thing I couldn't. She shakes her head. I can't imagine being an OB nurse while struggling with infertility. You're obviously a very strong woman. What choice did I have? I don't think of myself as strong. Unlucky, sure. On my worst days, I thought I was cursed, but strong? Why, because I didn't crumble? Because I didn't stop going to work or living my life? That was a luxury I couldn't afford. So I just kept moving, one day, then the next, and the next. Well, anyway, we made it through that season in our lives, and even though we both knew that we might always feel like something was missing, we had built a beautiful life together, and I was grateful for it, grateful for him. I look out the window. 
I think he felt the same way. I can feel her gaze on me. It sounds like you made the best of a bad situation and you did it together, she said softly. That's the most any couple could hope for, I would think. It's what I would hope for in the same situation. Yeah, I thought that too. We still had each other, no matter what. And then things changed. At first, when I quit my job, he understood that I wasn't going to watch one more woman die or suffer giving birth to a stillborn baby that she had had to carry in her womb for months knowing that it wouldn't live. Cecilia nodded. This she understood. She was a pharmacist, not a doctor or a nurse, but she knew these types of patients as well as I did and had worked with them as well. He said he understood, but I was also dealing with my father's illness. He was suffering from dementia, and we knew I was going to have to take over his business or sell it, and I think Patrick thought that was the real reason I had done what I did. It wasn't like him to not listen to me, to not believe me when I told him something. But now I see that he really didn't. He didn't believe that my quitting didn't have anything to do with my father or the business, that it was about watching these women suffering and not being able to help them. He thought I was overwhelmed and caring for my dad and couldn't handle the stress of the job on top of it. Cece's voice was gentle, unobtrusive. So what happened? My dad died, and instead of grieving and going back to work, I decided to use that sweet little drapery shop as a front for an illegal repro center. I laugh in spite of myself. Patrick finally realized that I had meant what I said all those months before, and he did not like it. So he was never supportive? I jump in surprise, and Cece lets out a startled yelp as we notice Ashley's face suddenly between us, her chin resting on her crossed arms, which are slung over our seat. What the hell, Ashley? Cece says breathlessly, placing a hand on her chest to indicate her racing heart. Ashley giggles. Sorry, figured you heard me moving around back here. She lifts her voice. Can't nobody sleep around here with you whipping around these back roads like a NASCAR driver. Oh, hush, troublemaker. Everyone's been perfectly content this entire ride, and then the social worker wakes up and gets all the passengers riled up. I should drop you off at the next rest stop. Oh, please do, she cries. I'm dying back here. I thought I was going to have to use this water bottle. Cece and I laugh, and I'm grateful for the release of tension. Hugh tells us there's a gas station several miles ahead and tells Ashley to do her best to hold it in until we get there. So, Ashley says, leaning forward and resting her head on her arms, I need you to distract me so I can make it another 10 miles in this car. Hope you don't mind me crashing your conversation. I smile at her. Not at all. It's nice to talk about it, actually. I don't have a lot of good friends at home. I have Vera. She's my father's old business partner, and now she handles a lot of work at the shop on both sides. She's like a mom to me, but girlfriends, you know, it's hard. I just don't really know who I can trust anymore, especially after what happened with Patrick. Heard that, Cecilia says. It's so hard to let anyone in. I've watched women I would have trusted with my life betray others. And believe me when I tell you, it's changed me. I don't trust anyone except Maddie with anything more personal than my grocery list. It's funny, Ashley says. Aside from the people living in my home and the people in this vehicle, you're the people I trust most in the world right now. And I haven't known any of you for more than a few years. Wild, isn't it? It really is, I say, so thank you. Thank you for listening. And to answer your question, I guess he tried to be supportive at first. Like I said, he considered himself a feminist and he said he believed in a woman's right to choose. He understood why Dobbs got it wrong. But after a while, even as the laws got crazier and crazier, he couldn't fathom the reasons why someone who had spent so much of their personal life trying to conceive children and so much of their professional life caring for them would now spend so much of their time. I drift off. I wouldn't finish the sentence using the words he had ultimately used. Killing them, Tamika says quietly, turning from the front seat to face us. He didn't understand how you went from caring for babies to killing them. I swallow the massive lump in my throat and nod. Cece discreetly slides her window down a crack and we all breathe the cold, grateful for the fresh air filling our lungs. Oh, fuck him, Ashley finally says, breaking the silence and sending a thin fracture through the heaviness in the car. Fuck him for saying that to you and fuck anyone who said it to you, Tamika. 
your early easy targets for their rage because you're on the front line. Even before we had to do this in secret, telling someone you believed a woman had the right to decide for herself what happened to her body meant that you were going to hear that you were a murderer, an evil person, the worst kind of sinner, and I am so goddamn tired of it. She leaned back in her seat, but before anyone could say a word, she popped back up. Let them spend one day with us. Let them talk to these women, to the young girls who rape by their uncles, to the women who are told their babies won't live outside the womb, to poor women who can't get birth control and get blamed when they're saddled with kids they can't afford. Let them do this work for one day and see what they have to say after that. She's preaching to the choir, but her words are good for my soul. The truth is that I carry Patrick's words around with me like a loaded suitcase. Even though I know logically that I'm helping people, and even though I believe that I can answer to my God for my work, doubts creep in all the time, and more often than not, they threaten to take me down. I can still hear the anger in Ashley's voice, even though she's taken a minute to catch her breath. They might call us the devil, ladies, but you remember, to the girls and women we meet in secret rooms and back alleys, we're doing the Lord's work. She leans forward once more, and I think she's going to wrap her arms around me. Instead, she raises her voice. Now, counselor, are you going to get me to a bathroom, or am I going to have to pee on these gorgeous leather seats? That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading, Amanda. Um, so, yes, I, just a glimpse of a, of a much larger work here um, on uh, a, a post row world uh and everything very timely and and um interesting too to hear that like you're you're basing this a lot on on the jane collective and everything when when you're writing this because i mean it's it's as much as there is real it's based in realistic history right now and everything it's it's a fictional account of of, of these characters and stuff but you know there's the whole history of the jane collective and everything how how do you how do you approach fiction in that way with those nonfiction historical connotations? I mean, are you conducting a lot of research, taking notes, um, or is it more, you know, you you know, how how is that approach for you? Um, well, I do a lot of research, which is taking so much more time than I ever expected or knew that it would. Um, but what's so interesting is what those women did back then was so remarkable, but the world has changed so much. And um, there are so many more factors to consider today that they didn't have to take into consideration, most of them having to do with technology. Um, but also just considering many different types of, of women and parents and circumstances and, um, and how women, uh, people are able to reach a much broader audience today and to help people in ways that they couldn't back then, um, but how that could also be much more dangerous today. Right. You kind of got that feeling, um, it, even in this scene, again, it, just a snippet of a much larger work, but like, you could feel this camaraderie between everyone in this van as as they're driving along and stuff and and the need to you know lean on each other as they're navigating this very difficult challenging uh post apocalyptic in a way world and everything um so just fabulous work um thank you so much for sharing with us tonight um stick around i'm going to go ahead and hand this back over to paul he's going to introduce our next reader for the night and uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so uh, I'm going to call Nicole Hansen up to the stage. There we go. Um, our next reader for the night is the talented Nicole Hansen. Nicole writes speculative fiction under the pen name Nick Tusa. She grew up in Long Island, New York, a place she dreamed of leaving before realizing that abandoning such good pizza might be a criminal offense. She is a paramedic, educator, researcher, and all around overachiever who refuses to let that's what she said jokes go the way of the dinosaur. Thanks for being here tonight, Cole, and go ahead, it's all yours. Thanks for having me. Um, quick content warning, there's a bit of blood um, in this. This is an excerpt from the beginning of my thesis novel, which is currently titled Grim Condition. 
An unusual number of people were exploding these days. It was common knowledge that spontaneous combustion was an entirely controllable phenomenon and therefore the most rare yet horrific way to die. That's what they teach you in EMT class anyway. Magic always complicated healthcare, and SponComs had been a legitimate threat in the beginning, even when people didn't fully understand how to balance their powers without being literally boiled by excess magic. Nowadays, SponComs were so unlikely that when they revised the textbooks to include magical maladies, the editors slid a quick five-sentence paragraph into the mental health chapter and called it a day. But here I was, 2.15 on a hot summer Thursday, ass in the air, Winnie the Pooh through the rear passenger window of a patient's crushed silver Nissan. The car, or what was left of it, was firmly wedged under the lift gate of a Mr. Pickles truck, and I had the pleasure of enjoying the smell of charred flesh and oxidizing hemoglobin. The heat radiating off the midday asphalt had sweat creeping down my back and made the floating particles of blood even stickier. When Mo and I got the call, the job text had only said we were responding to a two-car motor vehicle accident with a confirmed pin at Rockaway in the Van Wick. Since it was later in the day and it wasn't raining, the likelihood that it was some young idiot, drunk and speeding, was decent. Apparently, today was not my day to play the odds. The elderly woman in the driver's seat looked like an otherwise pleasant, law-abiding citizen. She was slumped at an awkward angle, forehead leaning against the bent and twisted steering wheel, and breathing in an uncertain, rattling manner I was not comfortable describing as normal. The two-year-old boy in the back seat, however, was breathing quite effectively. His panic screaming was easily audible over the constant drone of traffic and the buzzing of the jaws of life the firefighters were using to try to gain access to the matronly woman I assumed was grandma. Hi, buddy. My name is Corey, I cooed. I'm here to help. He stopped crying long enough to sniffle, wiping the snot from his nose with the back of his chubby-fingered hand. There was blood particles and particles of car seat foam splattered across the front of his Mickey Mouse t-shirt. The passenger seat in front of him bore the signs of explosion and a fast-moving, magically accelerated flame. We had arrived on scene within minutes, but the sheer force of the spawn comm left plasma and red blood cells unfazed by mere physics. I tried not to take too deep of a breath so as not to get a lung full of biohazards. I could feel my anxiety give my heart a gentle squeeze mid-beat. I shimmied my hips over the edge of the window to get a little further inside the car. What's your name, little man? Sujit. He dragged a pudgy hand across his face, smudging blood and tears. Hi, Sujit. I'm going to get you out of your car seat, okay? He nodded, so I started wrestling with the five-point harness. Whoever designed child safety seats made all of the buckles child and quarry proof I finally wiggled the belts free and scooped him into my arms, protecting his head as I backed out of the window. Holding the boy close to my chest, I could sense the first tendrils of magic begin to swirl through his veins, raising goosebumps across my skin as my magic recognized his. I had no idea what kind of magic he just inherited from whomever combusted, but someone was going to need to make sure he learned how to manage it, and quickly, before he met the same aerosolized fate as his recently exploded parent. Corey, Mo called, do you think you can fit through the window to grab head stabilization? As the sole female on scene, I was usually named de facto small spaces expert. Thankfully, the second ambulance we had requested as backup had arrived and I was able to hand Sujit over to the other crew. Repositioning my duty belt so my radio and narcotics pouch were nestled in the small of my back, I eased myself feet first through the blown out window. Stomping across the back seat, I got in position and gently eased grandma's head and torso backwards. She didn't respond to my touch. The noise from the Jaws of Life's gas-powered generator echoed through the remnants of the car's shell. As the fumes began to overwhelm the stench of blood, a final metal screeching noise indicated that the fires had de- firefighters had defeated the door. They eased it out of the way, and Mo leaned over to apply the cervical collar. I searched the space next to her trachea for a pulse. Thready, rabbit fast, but present and steady. I made eye contact with Mo and raised my eyebrows. He understood. Okay, guys, we need to get her out of here ASAP. As a team, we eased her gently out of the car and onto the waiting stretcher. With help from the firefighters, Mo secured the stretcher straps and went to load the woman into the back of our ambulance. There were two purses on the passenger floor, so I grabbed them as a firefighter reclined the driver's seat and offered me a hand. Thank you. I was incredibly grateful not to have to parkour my way out of the window. You're welcome, he smiled. You know you've got blood on you. Oh, I'm sure. My anxiety wriggled in my chest as the discomfort of being covered in bodily fluid settled in. The whole car was like a blood glitter bomb. I shrugged, backing away toward my ambulance. 
In the back, I peeled off my blood-stained gloves, tossing them in the wheel well. Mo was in the middle of taking our patient's blood pressure. I took a moment to pull the wallets out of the two purses and look for IDs. The first purse, belonging to Renisha Kaur, 36 years old, held a slim orange pill bottle of a, for an unfamiliar medication. I made a mental note to Google the drug name, a jumble of Z's and X's. The photo and the birth year on the second ID matched the woman lying on our stretcher. Anne Shakur, 73, I read off her driver's license. There was nothing else in her purse that indicated she had any medical issues. I popped open the side door and waved down the nearest police officer. He came over and I handed him the second purse. This is probably the DOA's, I said, and this is our patient. I held out the elder Mrs. Carr's ID so the officer could take a picture of it before stuffing it in the front pocket of my uniform shirt. I'd hand it off to the registrar at the hospital. Hopefully she was already in the system. Is she likely? The officer asked, eyes searching mine. I bit my lip before leaning back into the truck to shout to Mo. What you got? He pulled his stethoscope out of his ears. 70 over 40. Shit. Likely? The officer asked again. Not if I can help it. The officer nodded somberly, understanding how critical Mrs. Corr was. I pulled the door closed behind me to go help Mo. Grabbing an IV start kit and the liter bag of normal saline from the cabinet, I tossed it onto the bench seat next to him. Not sure saline's gonna cut, Corr. I know, he wasn't wrong. I didn't get to assess her fully yet, but I could already see the distension of her abdomen, which meant her belly was filling up with blood. She needed a surgeon, but even if we drove at top speed, I wasn't sure she was going to make it there in time, not without a little extra help. Mo stretched taut the loose skin of her arm, slapping the crook of her elbow, trying to will a vein to pop to the surface. Her blood pressure was so low that nothing was cooperating. I double checked for a pulse, a brisk flutter against my fingertips. I took a deep breath and focused my energy on the unsteady beat of her heart. The tingle grew slowly, like when you sleep funny and your arm falls asleep, but smoother and warmer. Magic danced from my fingers and under my patient's skin, coaxing her heartbeat to join in a stronger, more steady cadence, encouraging her lungs to find more oxygen in the air. The iron in her blood hummed in response, doubling their efforts to skip over breaches in her vasculature and stay in circulation. I released a brief surge of my power and the hummingbird fast pulse beat stronger against my fingertips, pallor receding from her skin. Got it, Mo said. He slid the IV catheter into place, the bright red flashback of blood in the chamber, a good sign that we had now had access. I spiked the leader bag and handed him the flushed line. I tilted the monitor to check the blood pressure, 90 over 60. A gentle flush of pink rose in her cheeks and she grew less clammy. Not great, but an improvement. Mo squinted at me. You cheated. I shrugged. She needed a little help. He rolled his eyes. And here I was, thinking my IV skills were just that good. You're a god amongst men, Mo. I smirked. Make sure to give yourself credit in the call report. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nicole. That was just wonderful. Um, and before I continue to, um, to praise that story and its author, I just want to let everyone know that we are going to go a little past uh, 9 o'clock. So I hope you'll stick around um, with uh, great stories like this. Uh, we don't want to rush anybody. Um, so Nicole, what's so amazing about this story is you're doing like so much great stuff at once. You've got this incredible narrative voice. You've got a really inventive um, kind of urban fantasy world. You've got this scene that is really compelling, a little bit of a mystery to it. Um, the revelation at the end that the character herself possesses magic. Um, it's just an incredible juggling act that's, that's thoroughly entertaining to, uh, to listen to and, to and to read. So uh, I just want to say kudos for that. Yeah. But, but also, um, what, it's just, just the milieu of this, the, the EMT milieu is, is so, it's, it's a bit unusual. Uh, you, don't, you don't see it, especially like in fantasy, I don't think. Um, so tell us a little bit about like, what, it, what, what was it that drew, drew you to, to this as the setting for your, for your story? Well, I guess it's the old the old adage, right? What you know. Um, I've worked New York City EMS for like over a decade, so um, a lot of the inspiration came from you know things that I've seen, um, coworkers that I've worked with, um, and this character kind of just came to me at one point, and I was like, oh, she needs she needs her story told. Um, so she, it was kind of like having like a new a new person on my ambulance, being like, oh, this is someone who like I can kind of imagine as being real, who I'd be like at work with and like, you know, just interacting with and 
doing these calls. Um, but yeah, the, the EMS Malo definitely does not does not have a lot of ground, unfortunately. It's a lot, but um, PD and fire, they definitely get their. Uh, oh, yeah, they get their, their yeah. do more. Yes, they do. But uh, I mean, you, the narrative voice is so strong and, and compelling and it's uh, I mean, you're just immediately on the side of this of this narrator and want to, to, to follow her and uh, know more about her. So I wish you the best of luck with this. And I'm going to pass uh, pass the mic over to uh, Jacob, who will introduce our last reader. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, yes, wonderful readers all tonight, and this will be our final one uh, of the night. And it is Melissa Kampfer. Uh, Melissa is a wife and mother of two from uh, Raleigh. Is it Raleigh, North Carolina? Raleigh. Miss, Raleigh. Oh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I should have double checked that. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, cooking, and crafting. After a lifelong battle with bipolar disorder and alcoholism, Melissa sought treatment in 2020 and decided to fulfill the dream of completing her college education and pursuing a career as a professional writer. She graduated with her BA in English literature and or English language and literature from Southern New Hampshire University in 2022 and was recognized as a distinguished scholar. She received her MA in English and Creative Writing Nonfiction in the spring of 2023 from SNU. She is currently completing a personal memoir, uh, Little Pink Elephant, about her struggles with addiction and mental illness and how the significance of a tiny treasured family heirloom, like a grandmother's stolen little pink elephant, can have a larger than life significance when one is searching for a deeper meaning in life. She also enjoys writing fiction and poetry. Thanks so much for being here, Melissa. We can't wait to hear it. Thank you. Okay, this piece is the last essay from my memoir, Little Pink Elephant. Uh, themes of alcoholism and suicide may be sensitive topics for some, but I think it's important to confront these issues head on and raise awareness about addiction and mental illness through my writing to show others that they're not alone. Um, I hope you enjoy this selection called Rehab. <clears throat> Everyone saw the warning signs and the bright red flags all around me waving in the wind. I refused to see it. I was sick and I wanted to die. Alcohol had replaced everything I cared about. I had lost myself in the bottom of a box of wine. I was shattered into a million mirrored pieces, and all I wanted to do was cut myself with those pieces so I could feel something. I was sitting at my kitchen island, a knife in one hand, my phone in the other. I had exhausted my call list of people to talk to. No one wanted to hear my ranting and raving anymore. I tried the suicide prevention hotline, but they put me on hold, so I hung up. They tell you to reach out for help, but they don't tell you that sometimes the help you need isn't there. Maybe fewer people would kill themselves if our mental health care system was better and if the suicide prevention hotline didn't put people on hold. I called the only number that registered in my brain at the time. I called 911 and pleaded for help from the stranger on the other end of the line. I need help. I want to kill myself. No one will listen to me. My husband locked me out of the bedroom and he won't open the door. I don't know who else to call. Please help me. I sobbed into my phone and the operator asked me if I had tried to hurt myself. I told her I had a serrated knife and I was going to slit my wrist. She told me to put the knife down and wait for someone to help. I'm sending someone to your location immediately. Within a few minutes, two squad cars pulled up outside and I met them at the door. Ma'am, do you have any weapons in the house? Is there anyone else inside? Yes, but I put the knife back in the kitchen drawer. My husband locked me out of the bedroom and my kids are asleep upstairs. So your husband knew you were suicidal and he locked you out of the bedroom? He doesn't know you called for assistance. He knew I was drunk. We had a fight and he told me he was tired of my shit. He doesn't know I called the cops, no. The female officer stayed downstairs with me and continued to talk to me and ask me questions about how much I'd been drinking, how long had I been having suicidal thoughts, did I want to hurt others or just myself, the standard issue litany of mental health intake questions. I heard the male officer knock on our bedroom door and Bobby finally opened it. What the fuck? was the only thing I could hear clearly from the upstairs landing. The officer came back downstairs with a simple, sympathetic look on his face. He said we were going to step outside and finish talking. The last thing I saw as I looked back over my shoulder was Bobby fuming on the landing at the top of the stairs and shaking his head back and forth. He didn't look concerned, he looked angry. I was sure my marriage was over. He had told me that earlier in the evening before I went upstairs, before he went upstairs. I told him that I needed help and he told me I just needed to stop drinking. I couldn't quit on my own. Addiction was a hurricane brewing inside of my mind. 
it's a tricky storm to weather because sometimes it appears to subside and the winds are gentle, like the eye of a storm. And other times it knocks you over and blows you away. Addiction tricks you into thinking that you're like everyone else. You're normal. Drinking's just for fun. The people all around you in the storm are being blown away too. But you convince yourself that everyone is safe and okay. It's just a little drink or two or five or the whole damn bottle. It isn't hurting anyone. On the way to the emergency room, I was scared and alone, but I realized I had been that way for a long time. I was slowly killing myself. My eyes were bloodshot. My face was blotchy and covered in little blistered bumps. My stomach ached, but I couldn't eat. My blood pressure was at stroke levels. I couldn't sleep. I would toss and turn all night and wake up in a cold sweat. My afternoons and nights were spent drinking myself into a stupor just so I could pass out and do it again the next day. I craved it like a juicy steak. Salivating like one of Pavlov's dogs at the sound of a cork popping is not a normal response. I wanted alcohol more than anything else. After I spent the night at the hospital and the alcohol from the previous night was out of my system, a police officer took me to a rehab facility. I was handcuffed in the back of a squad car. To free myself, I had to get there in chains. When the burly hulk of an officer removed my handcuffs, he led me into the building. I was terrified. Is all this necessary? I'm not a criminal. Am I really an alcoholic? Can I fix this? Do I even want to stop drinking? I went through the check-in process, the questions, the exams, the strip search. It was humiliating. Why do you need to examine every mole on my body, Nurse Ratchet? I'm not hiding any drugs or a bottle of wine under my skin. The doctors and nurses poked and prodded me like livestock. After all the medical evaluations were complete, they sent me to the hospital ward, where I walked into a disinfectant smelling room with all eyes upon me. I was exposed. My shoulders were hunched. My face was makeupless. My hair was a stringy mess, and I had on ugly slip resistant socks on my feet. Not a good look, Melissa. A nurse took me to my room. I sat on my bed and bowed my head in my head my, bowed my head in my hands. Stop crying like a simpering fool. What the hell is wrong with me? I finally got the courage to walk out of my room and into a large common room. I was surrounded by nurses doling out medicine to people shuffling around, trying hard not to make eye contact with each other. I found a, a chair far away from other people. I was frozen with my knees pushed to my chest, arms wrapped around my legs in a tight upright fetal position, just minding my own business. I sat there staring off with my glassy eyes, examining a paint pattern on the wall and imagining the paint blobs turning into blurry humanoid figures. There was a slight tremble in my limbs that I tried to stop by wringing my hands together. No one talked to me. I just want to be alone. A man in khaki dockers and a light blue woven polo shirt came over to me and knelt like he was going to put, a st put out his step stethoscope and examine me. My name is Steve. You just got here this morning, right? I saw you come in with the nurses. I thought I'd introduce myself and see if you needed anything. Um, no, I'm fine. Are you a doctor? No, sweetie, I'm not a doctor. I'm an alcoholic. Well, okay, Steve, why are you bothering me then? I didn't want to be rude because that wasn't how I was brought up. Grandma Fig used to say, a good Southern girl always keeps her manners even when she doesn't want to. I felt like vomiting on his brightly colored pink and baby blue flamingo pattern dress socks. I tried to focus on his face, but I was in a medicinal haze, making it impossible to see anything smaller than the wall ahead. When my eyes adjusted to his shape, I noticed his hair was neatly combed and flecked with salt and pepper near his temples. He had a fatherly, slightly stubbled face with a smile that reached his eyes. He stood up and hovered over me. I didn't notice how imposing he was until he was standing right in front of me. His belly bulged over his fitted pants. He looked like he was going to play a round of golf with my dad. He certainly didn't look like the rest of the younger ragamuffin patients in the room in sweats and mixed match socks. Or like me in ripped jean shorts and a t-shirt turned inside out because the nurses said my shirt was inappropriate for a rehab facility. I am the only idiot in the world who wears a drinking shirt to rehab. I drink and I know things. Ha! You know nothing, Melissa. I really should have changed that shirt before I left the house. There was an air of distinction about him, being so tall and well-dressed. He didn't look like an alcoholic, like the rest of us. We were walking zombies, and he looked fresh and clean. Am I sitting in your seat? I can move if you want. Just please leave me alone. Go away. I do not want to talk to you, Steve, the alcoholic. As if I had given him an invitation to sit down, he plopped down in the chair beside me and talked for the next hour about his life. 
He rambled on about his three failed businesses, his four failed marriages, his two estranged children. He worked in construction, something about building houses. I started to lose track of everything he said as he continued to press on with his story. He told me that I looked a bit like his daughter. He hadn't talked to her in a couple of years. He hadn't seen his new grandchild because his daughter refused to be around him. He listed all the things he had screwed up in his life because his family didn't understand him. He tried to drink and have a good time, but it always ended badly for him. A few whiskey cocktails at a dinner party and he was out of control. He needed the whole bottle. I feel you, Steve. Me too. He had been in rehab five times in five years. Every hospital was different, yet the same. He said sobriety was not for him, but he kept trying because he knew deep down that he had a problem. His latest wife made him go to rehab or she was going to leave him. Hmm, okay, weird guy, Steve the alcoholic. You should talk to a psychiatrist about all this, not me. You're a mess. We're all a mess. Now go away. So what's your story? I might be able to help you with all this craziness. He flourished his arms to accentuate the craziness he was referring to, not his own craziness. As if on cue, one of the patients started yelling at a nurse that she was late for her benzos. That's Anna. We call her Jersey Girl. She always fights to get more medicine. The woman's a nuisance. Do not give her a cigarette if she asks, because she will smoke them all and follow you around asking you for your meds. Or talk to you when you just want to be left alone. My name is Melissa, and I really don't know what I'm doing here. You know exactly why you're here, you liar. You might as well just say it. I guess I'm an alcoholic. There, I said it. Now go away, Steve. You're an alcoholic or you weren't sure that's why you're here. His accusatory look reminded me of my father again. I felt guilty for being so short with him. I wanted to fold myself into the chair cushions and disappear. Okay, Melissa, who may or may not be an alcoholic, here are a few tips. Always get up early. I get up at 630. That way you can get a cup of coffee before breakfast. The first cigarette breaks at seven. If you miss the break, you'll have to wait until lunch to go outside. And that's a long time to wait for a first smoke. And go to as many meetings as you can. The more meetings you go to, the more the doctors and nurses think you're cooperative, co cooperating. They like initiative. Try to smile. If you look sad all the time, they're never gonna let you out. They like happy, compliant patients. And whatever you do, don't act like Jersey Girl. She's gonna be in here forever if she doesn't stop her nonsense. Thanks. I'm going to go back to my room and rest. I didn't want to talk anymore. I felt like I was going to be sick again. If I throw up one more time, I swear I'm going to drown myself in the stupid toilet. I got up to leave and he lightly touched my arm. I didn't mean to scare you, Melissa. I like talking to new people because it makes me feel better. I get you don't want to talk right now. The first day is always hard. After you get the pink elephants out of your system, it gets easier. We can talk later and you can tell me your story. As I walked away from him, I turned back and he gave me a brilliant toothy politician smile. I was confused. What do you mean about pink elephants? Oh, that's what alcoholics call the sickness and the tremors. We call it seeing pink elephants. It's different for everyone, but I heard you had it pretty buff last night. The pink elephants were awful. The chills, the night sweats, the vomiting were almost too much to handle. All I could think about was another kind of pink elephant, the one my grandmother stole on her wedding day that was sitting at home in my china cabinet, technically between my, mon between my monogrammed wine glasses. I shyly smiled back at him and threw my hands up in a half wave. I should have been nicer to Steve because he was gone the next day. I should have made more of an effort to talk to him. He was transferred to another facility closer to his home in Florida. I felt empty inside. Maybe I didn't want to be alone after all. Good luck, Steve the alcoholic. My name is Melissa, and I'm an alcoholic, too. Thank you so much for reading uh, for us tonight, Melissa. I This one, um, what resonated with, with me in this one is that, you know, we get to know Steve, uh, just a, a glimmer of him uh, for, for a spell where he's he's talking uh, uh, to you in this rehab center, and then, he, then he's gone. And there's like that that feeling of suddenness to where it's like, well, he he was here, and it almost felt like he was just going to be a, 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 a omnipresence because of his knowledge and and like his background and his experiences and everything. And then and then suddenly, he's not there anymore. And like to me, you know, it it, it helps this character come to realize that you know, hello, my name is Melissa, and I'm an alcoholic too. But at the same time, it's kind of this this feeling of of isolation while still being in rehab and everything. And I think it just 
captures it beautifully and and everything. Um, so you're writing these these experiences. Uh, uh, I, I'm curious, is this a therapeutic session in in a way for you as well that that you're pursuing it in this way? Or uh, you had mentioned that you would like to share these these things um, uh, to folks out in the world. Uh, it kind of seems I see parallels to you know. Um, Aaron's piece, right, where he said, yeah, I want I want people to be aware of of um, PTSD and, and soldier suicide and, and trauma and everything like that. Um, it seems a lot of ways uh, this piece is kind of resonating in that way, too. Like, I, I want people to be aware of of these struggles and, and what people endure and everything. So, um, you know, what made you finally decide to sit down and say, I'm, I'm going to write this topic because I think it's important for people to know about. And well, the whole memoir is kind of like my journey um, and mm -hmm. my family's journey. And as the memoir progresses, you learn more about my family and the mental illness and alcoholism that runs through my family. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of my memoir is kind of mixed with my personal stories and my family's stories. And the final chapter, the final chapter of my book is is me going to rehab and finally breaking free of all of this other stuff that's been holding me back for so long um, and coming to the realization that I did have a problem. I do need to fix this. And I guess this, my sobriety is what made me start writing this stuff down because I never would have been able to do any of this if I was still drinking. Um, and I've been sober for three years now. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. So it, it's just the things that I've accomplished in those three years, I'm kind of amazed myself. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is really just my way of sharing that my journey with the world and showing, like I said, showing people that they're not alone, that there, there are people out there that are like you and you can do it, too. If I can do it, you can do it, too. Excellent. And I think I mean, you can it really resonates even in this one excerpt that you've shared with us and everything. So I really appreciate you sharing uh, your journey with us tonight. Um, we we are over time by uh, a bit, folks, but I think we have room for one question for all of our uh, readers if they want to pop on camera and we can go through um, and everyone can kind of share their thoughts and stuff. But um, I, Paul and I were kind of ultimately wondering what's next for everyone. Like, what are what what are you, what are you planning on doing next with your writing? When, now that you've you've earned the degree that you've sought. Uh, where where do you go from here? Um, so let me go ahead and start um, with Amanda, and then we can go around the room and and just kind of hear where your what what your long term goals are and and what you'd like to see next. So Amanda, take it away. Um, it's tough. I'm lucky that I work. Um, I teach English and writing, so I'm surrounded by people who uh, love and support. And so my primary goal is to prioritize and set time aside for my own writing and to finish this this story that I really am dying to tell and I really do think is important. So um, juggling work, the other things, um, you know, that's my my goal is just to be able to prioritize something that really is important to me. Yes, that that is going that is the one thing that is is. The constant challenge, right? It's finding that time to put aside to 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 continue the journey and everything. And I wish you uh, the best of luck with it. It's wonderful that you are surrounded by uh, students who uh, want to learn the craft or learn literature as well. So that's always inspirational too. I think that can that certainly help as well. Um, Sharon, you you had mentioned actually in your uh, bio that that I read uh, that you know you decided to pursue this MA in hopes of keeping your brain functioning at the highest level well into your twilight years. And I must say, by the way, like this bio is is quite impressive uh, in, in nature to um, earn all of these degrees and, and uh, serve in the, uh, uh, the Navy for 20 years and then retire twice <laughs> um, and with quite a span between them. So what is your goal ultimately with your writing and what do you hope to do with it in the next few years? Is it is it really just for your, your own personal pleasure or do you hope to do something else with it? Perhaps with that um, that degree that you uh, the, uh, earned at Webster University, the MBA. Well, I, first, I just want to say thank you to you and SNHU for this opportunity and for all the readers tonight. Those are such wonderful stories. 
Oh my God, I'm so touched. But to answer your question, so <clears throat> um, because I'm retired, I'm always looking for stuff to do. And as, as, a, as I was going through the program, I thought about how many people who are not able to read and write. And when I looked at the, st the statistics, sorry, there's like 39 million Americans who can't read. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great to join the literacy program in my community? And so I signed up for them to see if, to see if they'll accept as a volunteer. So my next step is to actually volunteer to teach someone how to read. And in the process, also read my stories to them as an inspiration and in hope they will say, oh, you know, here's an immigrant girl who's done all this and she is writing and reading a story. I can do it too. And so I just want to say that's my next step. I'm going to volunteer at a literacy program in my community. I'm going to pretend I'm still at SNHU and write one story a week, which, was, which, which I was forced to do. And so <laughs> I know that I can do that and I will do that and just hope I could create a program where we could read to people who cannot read in the hopes that it'll motivate them to learn to read and write. Awesome, that's wonderful and very, very inspirational. So uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Paul, do you, I'll, I'll jump over to you and then you can um, ask a couple questions to folks too here. Uh, sure, I'm gonna just ask the exact same question that, that you did and, and that's what, what lies ahead. And I'm gonna start with Kaylin. Uh, what, where, what, what do you see? I mean, you, you're, you're a world traveler. You've got all of these different irons in the fire with your, uh, your blog, your YouTube stuff, new novel coming out. What's next? Um, sure. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of familiar, um, goals just mentioned between Amanda and Sharon. Um, number one is just the constant, um, struggle to really just create a, a, a proper writing routine um, time-wise because I do have a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. So that is the, con you know, just the everlasting struggle of making time. <laughs> um, but I do want to, you know, publish my novel right now. I'm in the revision process. Um, and then with Sharon, you know, is just speaking to my heart um, because, you know, living here in Namibia, in Southern Africa, um, I have seen uh, just the major struggles when it comes to literacy. And that's exactly what I decided. One of the things I decided to do was um, start a literacy clinic um, because the numbers here are just staggering. Uh, and overall, you know, I would just really, since I'm based here, like to um, contribute to the writing community. And it's very young here, the literature community. And so I would, you know, like to use my experiences um, here to sort of um, tackle illiteracy and also uh shape Namibia help shape Namibia's um literary community uh and of course I would love to write a memoir as well that's you know down the line um just about my experiences living abroad so yeah yeah I mean I can I can see that you've got a lot to draw upon for your memoir for sure yes uh, definitely <laughs> let me let me um pose this question to you Aaron um aside from uh, visiting the North Pole uh what lies ahead <laughs> okay, well, uh, there's an irony that I haven't actually been in the North Pole. I've only been to the South Pole. Uh, I know, it, it, you know, it's slight, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a distinction. Um, either way, um, <laughs> it's the one with penguins. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Um, there you go. Yeah, I got I got to be honest. Um, you know, right now, professionally speaking, I mean, the VA paid for this degree for me because I'm trying to retrain. So, you know, ultimately what I'm trying to do with this is use what SNHU gave me in terms of marketing and freelancing and do a, 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 a freelance career um, with writing. Um, in terms of what I read tonight, um, I um, I, I've been published a couple times in some like sci-fi stuff and like that's great and I'll probably go back to writing sci-fi, but like honestly, um, the only thing I care about getting published ever in my entire career is uh, this novel that I wrote right here for uh, this program because that's it's out of my depth. It's not my normal thing and it matters. It matters a lot. So that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping to get that published and um, be a freelance writer so that I don't have to deal with bosses and crappy companies and I can, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> 
No, I can I can relate. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that, and I, I'm I'm sure you. you you'll find some some uh, agent interest in in that novel. I mean, based on what I what hope we so. Tonight. I hope so. I got to finish it first. I got to finish it first. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so Nicole, let me let me pose that to you. What is next for you? Oh, it looks like Nicole might have frozen. Uh, um. Well, let's, while we're waiting to see if she can come back out, let's kick it over to Melissa and see, yeah. see what, what's next for Melissa here. Um, I'm working on finishing my memoir. Um, at this point, I think I've got to got maybe have two books working <laughs> at the same time. Um, wow. Like I said, my, my memoir is kind of a collection of family stories and personal stories. And I'm at the point now where I'm wondering if maybe I should split them in two and, you know, instead of being one collection, have two collections. Um, but I'm looking for an agent and a publisher. Um, I also write short, I also write children's books. Um, so I'm kind of interested in that as well. Um, so maybe down the line, I'll get one of those published. Um, but right now I'm concentrating on my memoir um, and seeing where it goes with that, so. Awesome. Well, I, I am just in awe of all of you, uh, just, all of these endeavors and stuff sound wonderful. And I mean, every piece that was read tonight, none of you shied away from leaning into very serious, very meaningful and engaging topics. Um, and it was just a, a pleasure to hear all of you read and um, to read yours as well, Sharon. It was, it was, it was a wonderful night. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know, it looks like, I think we lost, we lost Nicole. Okay, so we lost Nicole, but we do wish her the best of luck. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close out the night for, for now, though, and just thank everyone for sticking around. Um, this is just has been a wonderful night. As I mentioned um, at the beginning, this is our last word for word for the academic year. So we want to thank everyone for their continued support in making this series a success. Um, this year, we we're really proud to spotlight, you know, fa fellow faculty. Um, host a young adult author, a historical sci-fi contemporary romance writer, a screenwriter. Um, we were able to facilitate a panel of uh, publishers and indie authors and, and showcase the Penman Review Fall Fiction finalists. And of course, tonight hosts just these exceptional graduates from our creative writing program. So uh, each of our readers and guests have offered deeply engaging works and conversations on creative writing and publishing, and we're just very thankful for this opportunity to um, talk with everyone uh, throughout the year. Um, for other word for word events, uh, please be sure to visit our YouTube uh, playlist channel, uh, which I uh, will be including in the chat. Um, and the event will also be available on the channel soon, so stay tuned. Um, and finally, I just want to say again, uh, best of luck to all of our graduates, um, Sharon, Aaron, Amanda, Nicole, Melissa, Kaylin. Uh, it's been my pleasure, uh, and I just wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. And thank you all so much, and we will see you in the fall. Well, thank you for having me. Best of luck. Thank to you, you very much. Thanks okay. so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.